I have always loved Halloween. When I was a kid, I adored trick-or-treating, and as I got older and eventually had my own place, the tradition evolved. I found just as much joy in handing out candy to kids, watching their faces light up with excitement as they ran around in their costumes. It always filled me with a sense of nostalgic wonder and a little bit of spooky fun. I live in a quiet, pleasant neighborhood. It's the kind of place where everyone knows everyone, and things are peaceful. I was lucky to land a good job early on, which allowed me to buy my own house in my mid-twenties. I didn't need a roommate or housemates, something I took great pride in. The neighbors knew I lived alone, and it was fine by me. It gave me the freedom I craved. One Halloween night. Everything seemed perfect. The evening went by without a hitch. I spent it handing out candy to the trick-or-treaters, but as the air turned colder and the night deepened, fewer children appeared at my door. Soon the streets were empty. With nothing else to do, I settled into the couch, put on some classic horror films, and let myself enjoy the rest of the holiday in peace. Even though I love Halloween, I have to admit that scary movies still get to me. There's something about the eerie atmosphere they create, especially when you're alone. My living room couch faced a large picture window that looked out onto my front lawn, and it always made me uneasy during nights like this. I had a sense that, at any moment, I might turn around and see something out there. Someone standing in the shadows. As I watched the movie, I thought I heard a faint noise behind me. It sounded like tapping on the window. At first, I brushed it off as my imagination running wild, but it kept happening. I glanced over my shoulder a couple of times, squinting into the darkness outside. Nothing. Just the empty lawn. Trees swaying gently in the breeze. I knew it was all in my head, but that didn't make it any less unsettling. The movie eventually ended, and exhaustion began to creep in. Finally, I convinced myself it was time for bed. Living alone, I've always been the type to close my bedroom door at night, and not just because of the movies. I've never liked leaving doors open while I slept. Whether it was my bedroom door or closet doors, they all had to be closed. There was something about the thought of waking up and seeing someone standing there, watching me, that sent a shiver down my spine. That night, with the creepy movie still fresh in my mind, I felt more on edge than usual. As I lay in bed trying to shake off the anxiety, I heard a soft knock. My bedroom door was shut, just as it always was. The sound startled me, making me sit up and listen. But after a moment of silence, I reminded myself that it's common for people to hear knocking or other noises when they're just drifting off to sleep. My racing heart slowed, and I convinced myself it was just that. With a deep breath, I closed my eyes again and eventually drifted off. I woke up a little while later, my alarm clock's glow the only thing lighting the room. It wasn't time to get up yet, but something had stirred me from my sleep. I lay still, trying to figure out what had woken me, when I sensed movement near the doorway. Slowly, I turned my head, and my worst nightmare became reality. There was someone standing in my bedroom doorway. The figure was tall and dark, their features indistinguishable in the shadows. My heart pounded in my chest as terror gripped me. I wanted to believe I was still dreaming, but I wasn't. This was real. I could feel the cold sweat forming on my skin. Trick or treat, the figure said in a low, guttural voice that sent a chill down my spine. I froze, my mind racing, trying to comprehend the situation. But years of watching horror movies hadn't left me completely helpless. My instincts kicked in. Without thinking, I reached for the nightstand drawer beside my bed and pulled out the loaded gun I always kept there. The figure must have seen me move because they immediately backed away, retreating into the darkness of the hallway. I could hear footsteps, soft but quick, moving through the living room. My ears strained to pick up any other sounds. The door opening. A creak. Anything but there was only silence. For a few moments, I sat frozen in place, my gun clutched tightly in my hands, trying to figure out what to do next. 
Was the intruder still in the house, hiding somewhere, waiting for me to come out? Gathering my courage, I slipped out of bed and crept into the living room. The lights were still off, and the shadows felt thick and oppressive. My eyes darted around, searching for any sign of the intruder. But the room was empty. The front door was wide open, but I hadn't heard it close. Had they really left? Slowly, I approached the door and locked it, making sure it was secure this time. Then, I hurried back to my bedroom, locked that door as well, and turned on every light in the room. I grabbed the phone and called the police. I backed myself into the corner of the room, my gun still in hand, waiting for the authorities to arrive. When the police finally showed up, they searched the house thoroughly. But there was no sign of anyone. No forced entry. No evidence that anyone had broken in at all. It was like the figure had simply vanished into thin air. But I knew what I saw, and I wasn't going to let myself brush it off as a figment of my imagination. From that night forward, I never left my doors unlocked again. The safe neighborhood I had taken for granted didn't feel as safe anymore. Halloween would never feel quite the same. I haven't driven a car in years. It's not that I didn't try. I got a driver's license once, but I was never great at it. Eventually, I let it expire and stopped driving altogether. I've spent most of my life walking everywhere, or when I had one, riding a bicycle. This story takes place many Halloweens ago, during one of those years when I didn't have a bicycle. I was living alone in a house located in a neighborhood that wasn't exactly the best. The part I disliked most about the area was how people treated their animals. I won't get into the debate of whether it's okay to let your cats roam the streets, but what really got to me was how people ignored the town's leash laws. There were always dogs roaming free, and that caused its share of problems. That Halloween night was unusually cold. The temperature had dropped into the 30s, which was strange for where I lived. It was usually still pretty warm in October. I had originally planned to go out earlier in the day to buy some Halloween candy, but it was too cold, and I convinced myself to stay indoors. However, as night fell, my craving for chocolate intensified. Eventually, I bundled up in layers of clothing and decided to make the trek to the nearest Dollar Tree to grab some candy. The streets were eerily quiet for Halloween night. There were no trick-or-treaters, no kids dressed in costumes, no laughter or spooky decorations. It felt wrong, but I chalked it up to the unusual cold weather. People just weren't used to this kind of chill. As I walked, I noticed a large white dog hanging out in front of a house across the street from me. It started barking as I approached, but I didn't think much of it. That was normal for the neighborhood. But then, as I turned the corner... The dog suddenly bolted across the street toward me. My heart skipped a beat. I froze, holding my hand out, palm up, trying to show the dog I wasn't a threat. The dog paused, sniffing the air, then started barking again, edging closer. My instincts kicked in, and I began walking faster. The dog followed, barking louder with every step, closing the distance between us but never quite catching up. Eventually, it gave up and stopped chasing me. By the time I reached the Dollar Tree, my nerves were on edge, but I managed to get my chocolate and started heading back home. I was still cold despite all the layers, and I wanted nothing more than to be inside my warm house. As I retraced my steps, my thoughts kept returning to that dog. I really didn't want to face it again on the way back. Then I remembered something. There was an old graveyard nearby. If I cut through someone's backyard, I could slip into the graveyard and avoid walking past the dog's house altogether. It wasn't exactly the most appealing option, but at that moment, the idea of a creepy walk through the graveyard seemed better than dealing with that dog again. I hated the thought of trespassing through someone's yard, but I did it anyway. The graveyard wasn't far. And like most graveyards, it had a road that cut through it. The road wasn't paved, 
just dirt, and there were no lights. The darkness felt thick and suffocating as I started walking through, but I told myself it would be fine. I didn't believe in ghosts or anything supernatural, so I wasn't really scared. Or at least that's what I kept telling myself. The wind whispered through the trees, and my footsteps crunched over fallen leaves. I wasn't sure if the chill I felt was from the cold or something else. My breath formed little clouds in the air, and I kept glancing around, trying to shake off the unease creeping up my spine. Suddenly, I heard something. A distant yell. It sounded far off, but it made me stop in my tracks. Was it coming from a nearby house, or from the graveyard itself? I couldn't tell. My pulse quickened and I hesitated. Was someone out there? I strained to hear more but was met only with silence. My mind started playing tricks on me. Was that a scream, or was it just the wind? After a few moments, I convinced myself it was nothing and kept walking, though my pace quickened. Then, I saw movement ahead of me, a figure walking toward me. My stomach clenched with apprehension. It was too dark to make out any details, but someone was definitely there. I told myself it was probably just another person walking through the graveyard, but the tension in my body refused to ease. As I continued walking, the figure suddenly stopped, then darted off into the darkness, disappearing behind a cluster of gravestones. That was weird. Really weird. Why would someone run off like that? My thoughts raced as I approached the spot where the figure had disappeared. I slowed down, looking around, but I couldn't see anyone. The unease from earlier had returned, stronger now. I kept walking, deciding it was best to just get home as quickly as possible. That's when I heard it. A low, guttural groan coming from somewhere up ahead. I froze, heart pounding in my chest. Another groan followed louder this time. My breath caught in my throat as I looked toward the sound. In the faint moonlight, I saw something, or someone, slowly climbing over a gravestone. It looked like a person pulling themselves out of the ground, their movements slow and labored. My mind screamed, zombie, and I almost turned and ran. But then the figure groaned again, and I realized this wasn't a creature from a horror movie. This was a person a very injured person. Help! The figure groaned, barely audible. I rushed toward them, heart still racing. When I got closer, I could see that they were covered in blood. My stomach lurched. He stabbed me, the man said, his voice shaky. Please, help me. My hands fumbled as I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. I explained as best I could that I was in the graveyard with a man who had been stabbed and needed immediate help. As I was talking to the dispatcher, it hit me. The figure I had seen earlier, the one that had darted off into the graveyard, that must have been the person who attacked him. I told the dispatcher about it and urged them to send police as well. After I hung up, fear gripped me again. What if the attacker came back? What if he was still lurking somewhere in the graveyard? waiting for the right moment to strike again. I crouched down next to the injured man, trying to stay calm, but every sound made me jump. The wind rustling the leaves, the distant hum of a car. Even my own breathing seemed too loud. Time stretched on, each second feeling like an eternity. Finally, I heard sirens in the distance. Relief washed over me, but I didn't let my guard down until I saw the flashing lights of the ambulance and police cars. They arrived, and the paramedics quickly got to work on the injured man. I stayed to give my statement to the police, explaining what I had seen. Unfortunately, I couldn't give them much to go on, but the victim knew who had attacked him. By the time I got home, Halloween was over. I was still shaken, but I had my chocolate. And somehow, that small comfort was enough to get me through the rest of the night.
I still remember that Halloween night like it was yesterday, even though it was the fall of 1998. I was 13, still young enough to trick or treat, but old enough to know it would probably be my last year. You know, that awkward age where you're not a kid anymore but not quite ready to let go of the things you love? Yeah, I was right there. My best friends, Josh and Ethan and I had made plans weeks in advance. It wasn't just about the candy. Halloween in our town was a huge deal. Streets would be packed with children, and parents partied while kids ruled the night, running through lawns with half-assed costumes causing mischief. The houses were decorated to the max, with fake spider webs stretching across porches, jack-o'-lanterns flickering orange on every step, and skeletons hanging from trees. And the air, it had that crisp bite, just cold enough to see your breath when you exhaled, but not so cold you needed more than a sweatshirt. You could smell the damp earth, fallen leaves, the chocolate, and a little something else. That scent of plastic from store-bought costumes. Man, it was perfect. The three of us had met up at Josh's house as soon as dusk started to creep in. His parents were hosting one of those Halloween parties for grown-ups, the kind where they hand out apple cider to the kids and spiked cider for themselves. We had on our last-minute costumes, nothing fancy. Ethan had thrown on a scream mask, Josh was a zombie, and I was wearing a cheap Batman cape with a black hoodie. We hit the houses on our street first, just to get things going. The wind rustled the orange and yellow leaves at our feet as we walked, and you could hear them tumble along the pavement. The sun had just about disappeared, leaving behind this deep purple hue in the sky, the last light of day slowly fading away. Porch lights flicked on, and soon we were moving through the first wave of trick-or-treaters, those little kids with their parents holding pillowcases already stuffed with candy. The sounds of giggling, the wind blowing through the trees, the occasional shriek from someone who got spooked by a fake ghoul on someone's lawn, it felt like Halloween in its purest form. After a few blocks, we made our way to Franklin Street. Now Franklin wasn't like the other streets. It had the biggest houses, old Victorians that had been there for over a century. They always went all out for Halloween each house trying to one-up the other with elaborate decorations and bowls filled with full-sized candy bars. All of the houses on Franklin Street looked like they came straight out of a Halloween movie. All except one. The Mallow House. Everyone in town knew about the Mallow Place. It was creepy all year round, not just Halloween. The house had been built sometime in the 1800s, three stories tall with an overgrown yard that looked like it hadn't been mowed since before I was born. The owners, Mr. and Mrs. Mallow, were an older couple who never came outside. I think I saw Mr. Mallow once or twice picking up mail, but he was always gone before I could say hello. As we got closer to Franklin, Josh nudged me. Give you a handful of candy if you knock on the door at the Mallow place this year. I laughed it off. Psych! And then what, get murdered? But deep down, I was feeling that familiar pull. The dare. The challenge. It wasn't Halloween without doing something a little stupid, right? We made our way down Franklin Street, along with all the other trick-or-treaters. There was a constant buzz of chatter and laughter as we joined the crowd moving slowly down the sidewalk. The Mallow House loomed ahead of us as we made our way closer to it, sitting completely dark. The gate at the front of the yard was open, the path leading up to the front porch covered in a layer of wet leaves. As usual, there were no decorations, no fake cobwebs, no plastic tombstones, no pumpkins. But it didn't need scary decorations. The house was scary enough on its own. I didn't even have to say it aloud. We all knew it was next. Josh and Ethan started slowing down as we got closer, and I could feel the shift in the air. The excited banter between us had faded to an awkward silence. It was that kind of house that no one really talked about, but everyone knew to just stay away. You always passed by a little quicker, maybe glanced at it out of the corner of your eye, but you never lingered. It wasn't because it was haunted. There were no ghost stories. It was just creepy. People whispered about the Mallows, mostly rumors. Mr. Mallow was some kind of veteran, though no one was sure, and Mrs. Mallow was even more of a mystery. 
Some said she had dementia and was shut up in one of the upstairs rooms. Others swore she was dead. Either way, no one had seen her in years. I'm not going up there, they're freaking weirdos, Ethan said. He tried to sound casual, but I could hear the edge in his voice. Josh kicked at the sidewalk, trying to act like he wasn't bothered. I glanced up at the house. A hulking Victorian with peeling paint, sagging roof, and windows that seemed too narrow, like they were squinting down at you. Every year, that house stood there, untouched by Halloween spirit, no pumpkins, no lights, nothing. Josh, of course, wasn't going to let it go. He had this thing about proving himself, especially if Ethan and I were around. That year, we'd spent most of our afternoons watching Faces of Death tapes in his basement, trying to outdo each other's tolerance for gore. He'd never admit it, but this wasn't about candy. It was about who would back down first. He nudged me, a grin plastered on his face. I'll go if you go. My stomach nodded, but I wasn't about to back down, not in front of them. Fine, I muttered, but we're in and out. We knock, get the candy, and leave. Ethan looked between us, clearly not thrilled, but he wasn't about to be the only one to chicken out. Let's just make it quick, he said. I don't want to hang around this place. We crossed the street and made our way toward the Mallow House. The closer we got, the colder it seemed to get, as if the place had its own climate. I could feel the dampness in the air now. The earthy smell from the neglected garden mixed with the scent of old wood. Our footsteps crunched softly, and the sound seemed to disappear into the thick silence surrounding the house. When we reached the gate, we paused. The iron bars were rusty, and the gate itself hung crooked on its hinges, like it hadn't been opened in years. But tonight it was ajar, just wide enough for us to slip through. Josh, ever the brave one, was the first to step inside. The moment he crossed the threshold, the air seemed to thicken. I followed, feeling the weight of the atmosphere pressing down on me. Ethan brought up the rear, looking back over his shoulder every few seconds, as if expecting something, or someone, to jump out from behind the bushes. The porch creaked under our weight as we climbed the steps. I could see the door now. A massive oak thing with a brass knocker shaped like a lion's head. It looked ancient, the kind of thing that looked like it belonged in a museum. The windows were dark, covered with heavy curtains that looked like they hadn't been opened in decades. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched from behind them. I reached out and grabbed the knocker. I hesitated for a second, my hand hovering over the cold brass before bringing it down with a loud thunk. The sound echoed through the house, hollow and unsettling. We waited. For a long moment, nothing happened. The wind picked up, rustling the leaves in the yard, but inside the house there was only silence. Josh shot us a look, trying to play it cool, but I could see the tension in his jaw. Well, he whispered, I guess no one's home. Ethan turned to leave. Sorry guys, nope. Peace out but before he could leave, we heard it. The faint creak of floorboards, like someone shifting their weight inside. We froze. Another creak, closer this time. Then the soft click of the lock being turned. The door opened slowly, inch by inch, until it revealed a narrow gap. No light came from inside, just darkness so thick it felt like it could swallow us whole. And then, a voice low, raspy. Come in. I glanced at Josh, expecting him to make some stupid joke and bolt, but his face had gone pale. Ethan took a step back, muttering under his breath. Hell no, man. No way. But before any of us could move, the door opened wider. Standing there in the doorway was Mr. Mallow. He looked even older than I expected, more skeletal. His skin was waxy stretched tight over his bones and his eyes. You couldn't see them. They looked hollow, empty, shadows casted around them like two black holes. He didn't smile, didn't offer any kind of greeting, just stood there staring at us. 
His clothes were dirty, stained in patches I couldn't identify, and his hands... His hands were covered in something dark, like oil. My stomach turned as I tried to make sense of it all. Trick. Or treat. Josh said weakly, his voice cracking. Mr. Mallow's gaze flicked down to Josh, then back to me, and finally to Ethan. His lips twitched, like he was trying to smile but had forgotten how. Slowly he raised one hand, motioning for us to come inside. You boys are just in time, he rasped. We've been waiting. I felt something cold run down my spine. We? Ethan stepped back again, his voice barely audible. Let's go. Now. But before we could move, something shifted in the shadows behind Mr. Mallow. I couldn't see it at first, just the movement, something dark. Then slowly, as my eyes adjusted, I began to make it out. It was Mrs. Mallow. Or what was left of her. We stood frozen at the door, eyes locked on the sight before us. Mrs. Mallow was hunched over at the kitchen table, barely illuminated by the dim light. At first glance, she almost looked normal, just an old woman sitting down for a quiet meal, her thin hands resting limply on the table, as though she'd been waiting for someone, waiting for us. But then I saw it, the way her body sagged, like something inside her was giving way, crumpling. Her head lolled to the side, neck bent at an impossible angle, and her body seemed to deflate, slumping lower as if gravity was pulling her apart, piece by piece. Her skin, pale and waxy under the faint light, clung loosely to her bones, too loose, sagging in folds as though her flesh was simply draped over a frame that was barely holding together. She didn't move at first, just sat there, her empty eyes staring at us. But then, there was this sound. It was low at first, a faint crinkling noise. Mrs. Mallow began to shift, slowly, horribly. Her legs seemed to twitch, her knees jerking unnaturally beneath the table as her whole body started to fold in on itself, collapsing in slow motion. Her back arched, her spine pushing out against her thin skin, the bones grinding and popping as if they were breaking apart, rearranging themselves in ways they weren't supposed to. She was twisting, contorting, her limbs bending into unnatural angles as her body crumpled lower and lower until she finally poured out of the chair, hitting the floor with a dull thud. For a second, she didn't move, just lay there in a heap, her limbs splayed out, her chest heaving in shallow, rasping breaths. Then, slowly, horrifyingly, she began to crawl. Her hands slapped against the floor, too fast, too eager, like some twisted animal skittering across the ground. Her skin, that loose, sagging skin, dragged behind her as she moved, sticking to the floor in patches like it was melting off her bones. She crawled on all fours, her body twitching with each movement. But her head, her head stayed locked on us. Those empty, hollow eyes fixed on us, unwavering, like she could see us even though there was nothing there behind them. Nothing but blackness. Her mouth hung open, jaw unhinged, but instead of words, a wet, gurgling sound bubbled up from her throat, thick and choking. Like she was trying to speak, but something inside her was broken. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. My legs were locked in place, my mind screaming at me to run, but my body just wouldn't listen. She was getting closer, too fast, her hands slapping against the floor, her joints popping and grinding with every jerking movement, and her face. God, her face. It was rotting, decaying, skin peeling away from her cheeks in thick, wet strips, revealing the gray flesh beneath. The stench hit us then, thick and rancid, the unmistakable smell of something long dead something that had been festering in the dark for far too long. Josh let out a strangled gasp, his voice barely a whisper, and he grabbed at my sleeve. Run, he said, his words trembling. Now! But I couldn't tear my eyes away from her, 
She was almost at the door now, her gnarled fingers reaching out toward us, clawing at the air, reaching out for us. Suddenly, her body convulsed, her back arching violently as her whole frame shuddered. Then she collapsed again, her head hitting the floor with a sickening crack. But she didn't stop. She kept coming, crawling, scraping, inching closer and closer. Josh was the first to break. He shoved past us, bolting down the steps and back toward the street. Ethan and I were right behind him, not looking back, just running, running as fast as we could. I could hear the door creak shut behind us, but no footsteps followed. Just that horrible silence. We didn't stop until we were halfway down the block, gasping for breath, hearts pounding in our chests. I glanced back at the Mallow house, half expecting to see them standing there, watching us, or worse, chasing us. But the porch was empty. The door closed. We didn't say anything for a long time. Just stood there, gulping down cold air, staring back at the Mallow house, expecting... something. But nothing happened. The place was dark and silent again. Like it had always been. I could still see the faint glimmer of that dim porch light, but otherwise it was just another shadow on the street. Ethan was the first to speak. His voice was hoarse, shaky. What the hell was that? Did you see that? Was that... What... What was that? Josh didn't answer. He was bent over, hands on his knees, still catching his breath. But I could see it in his face. He saw it too. He was more freaked out than I'd ever seen him. That cocky grin he always had was gone, replaced by the look of a scared child. I swallowed, my mouth dry. My brain was still trying to catch up with what I'd seen. That... thing. That couldn't have been her. Not really. No one's body was supposed to look like that. The way she moved, the way she looked... The image was burned into my mind, and I felt vomit forming in my throat. Josh straightened up, finally breaking the silence. That wasn't normal, he said, his voice flat. There's no way that was normal. What do we do? Ethan asked, his eyes wide, darting between Josh and me. We can't just leave it like this. What if someone else goes there tonight? That wasn't just some crazy old couple. That was... Josh cut him off, his voice hard. We're not doing anything. We're going home, and we're forgetting this ever happened. Are you serious? I blurted out. We can't just pretend we didn't see that. What if something's really wrong in there? What if they need help? Josh whipped around, glaring at me. Did they look like they wanted help to you? That was messed up, man. I'm not going back there, and you shouldn't either. It's not our problem. I opened my mouth to argue, but the look in Josh's eyes shut me up. He wasn't being a tough guy anymore. He was scared. Really scared. And maybe he was right. What could we even do? Call the cops? Tell them what? Ethan was biting his lip, his hands shaking. Man, I just want to go home. Let's go. We started walking, fast at first, like we could outrun the memory of that house of Mrs. Mallow's twisted body. But it stuck with me, clinging to the back of my mind like a nightmare I couldn't shake. By the time we reached Josh's place, the adrenaline had worn off, leaving us exhausted and rattled. We didn't even bother to check the rest of our candy haul. The excitement of the night had soured, curdled into something darker, something we didn't want to talk about. Josh's parents were still in the living room when we barged in laughing with their friends, oblivious to what had just happened. For a second, the normalcy of it made me feel unhinged, like maybe we had imagined the whole thing. But I knew we hadn't. I could still see the way Mrs. Mallow's body moved, like a puppet with tangled strings. I'm going to bed, Josh muttered, not even bothering to say goodnight. Ethan and I mumbled something in return, but no one was in the mood for conversation. We were all too busy replaying what had just happened, trying to make sense of it. 
Ethan and I headed upstairs to Josh's room, but neither of us bothered to change into pajamas or unpack our sleeping bags. We just laid there, staring at the ceiling. Every creak in the house, every groan of the floorboards made my heart jump. I kept picturing Mrs. Mallow's face. No, not her face. Her mask. That's what it looked like. A mask stretched too tight over something rotten underneath. I couldn't shake the feeling that she'd been watching us, not just looking at us, but really seeing us, like she'd marked us somehow. It was a stupid thought, but it stuck with me all night. I was terrified I'd wake up, and she'd be standing over me. Eventually, I must have fallen asleep. But it wasn't restful. My dreams were a mess of dark hallways, twisted bodies, and eyes. Those hollow, empty eyes staring through me. When I woke up the next morning, my skin was slick with cold sweat, my heart still pounding. We didn't talk about the Mallow House the next day. Not really. Josh was quiet, distant, which wasn't like him. He usually couldn't stop running his mouth, but now he just mumbled answers, kept his eyes down, and didn't crack a single joke. Ethan left early, muttering something about having to help his dad with some yard work, but I knew he just wanted to be out of there. I didn't blame him. The whole thing felt like we had stumbled into something humans weren't supposed to see. I left soon after, walking back to my house in the cold autumn sunlight, but the daylight didn't help. The world felt quieter, heavier. I couldn't get rid of the uneasy feeling sitting in my chest, like something bad was coming for me. That night, I kept thinking about what Mr. Mallow had said. We've been waiting. Waiting for what? Why had they opened the door for us? I tried to push the thoughts away, but they wouldn't leave. Every shadow seemed a little too dark, every creak of the house a little too loud. I didn't sleep well for days. And then, about a week later, I heard the news. Mr. and Mrs. Mallow were dead. It wasn't until the smell started leaking out of the house that the neighbors called someone to check on them. They found Mr. Mallow dead in his recliner. He had been dead for weeks. Burr Mrs. Mallow, they found her body upstairs in a chair, rotting. The coroner said she must have been dead for at least a year. Mr. Mallow had never told anyone. But I saw her. I saw both of them. We all did. That night. I swear we saw her moving, walking, staring at us with those dead eyes. I didn't believe in ghosts, but I couldn't explain what we saw. Josh wouldn't talk about it. Neither would Ethan. We all just went back to our lives, pretending like it hadn't happened. But it stayed with us, lingering in the back of our minds. A memory we didn't want, but couldn't shake. The town boarded up the house and left it to rot. No one wanted to buy it. No one even wanted to even get close enough to tear it down. But every year, near Halloween, when the air turns cold and the leaves start to fall, I think about that night. About what we saw. About what really happened in that house. That sound. That wet crunch of her body as it hit the floor. It's burned into my memory. I swear I can still hear it sometimes, like an echo in the back of my mind. I had been right. That was, in fact, the last year I ever went trick-or-treating. Preface this by saying that, all my life, my family and I have experienced things that we can't always explain. We've never let them be the central focus of our lives no matter how disruptive things can get sometimes. That being said, one of the things I remember experiencing that I couldn't shake for years after, and still gives me the creeps, was the night nearly 24 years ago that our little family unit fled our home and camped out in my parents' guest room for at least a week. We were almost a year married. We had a beautiful newborn son, maybe two weeks old at the time. We were living in my in-law's detached guest house while we saved to buy our own home. The guest house was small. A teensy kitchen, minuscule living room, narrow bathroom, and surprisingly spacious bedroom. 
This place had always had vibes, but when you're young and excited at the prospect of being all grown up and married, those kind of things go by the wayside, being otherwise insignificant, though alarmingly fear-inducing. Anyway, that evening we'd experienced a strange spate of tapping and knocking on the wall and ceiling. My husband John was irritated by it and steadfastly trying to ignore it. Our baby seemed unperturbed by the sporadic rapping and slept peacefully on my chest as I lay reclined in bed. I'd had a C-section and was still taking it pretty easy around the house, with John gamely pitching in with chores and cooking meals. He suddenly stood up and said he was hungry and said he was picking up some fried chicken for our dinner. I said okay, and after kissing us, he left. I gently laid the baby at my side and curled my body carefully, protectively, around him, and we drowsed comfortably, with the TV in our room burbling away companionably on low volume. I woke to a feeling of extreme heat at my back, and wondered groggily about a heating pad before remembering that I didn't have one. The baby was awake, eyes wide and watchful, a different look than his usual sleepy gaze. I smiled at him, but he wasn't looking at me. He was looking over my shoulder. His eyes widened, and in their liquid reflection I saw something. To this day I don't know what, but it was large and cloudy, and then my baby flinched, startling, and he screamed. A newborn baby, screaming. It was god-awful, and sent shivers right through me. I gathered him to me immediately, cradling him against me gently, my back still to the room, still feeling an inexplicable heat radiating at my back. My eyes pricked with tears to feel my baby trembling, his baby body tense and all a quiver. He couldn't even cry properly. It was as if he couldn't catch his breath. I kept murmuring, It's okay. Mommy's here. I'm here. It's okay. Shh and then I heard running footsteps outside and John calling for me. The sound of his voice filled me with relief. He burst into the house and I'll never forget how wild-eyed and scared he looked. He enveloped us in his arms and held us to him. The baby had stopped crying, but was breathing fitfully after his terrifying crying jag. John said he was just leaving the drive through when he felt an impending sense of doom and a horrible feeling that something awful was happening to us. He raced home and said he kept catching every red light, was caught behind every slow driver. And when he got to our driveway, the porch light over his mom's front door popped. He was trembling too. I told him what happened with me and the baby, and he looked around the room. We didn't know what to make of it. It felt awful. We went for a drive, ended up at his brother's place, and stayed until late before returning home. By then, the oppressive feeling from before had gone. The room was normal. We put the baby in his crib and moved it right beside our bed. We left the TV on and fell asleep to Mad TV. I woke to complete darkness and John's terrified screaming, Turn on the lights! He's dead! He's dead! Turn on the lights! The baby's dead! I nearly fainted in terror except the sound of John's running footsteps and the room suddenly flooded in. Light yanked me back in the moment. He was holding our son in his arms, our screaming baby boy, and John's face was anguished, terrified as he thrust the baby at me, still crying that he was dead. But he wasn't. Our baby was screaming horribly as he had earlier that evening, but he wasn't dead. I held the baby close and he searched my breast out, frantically latching on. I grasped John's hand tightly and told him the baby was okay. He looked from my face to the desperately suckling baby and then back at me and burst into fresh tears. I thought he was dead, he sobbed. I dreamed he was... something bad got him. He wrapped his arms around my waist, pressing his face against the baby. He was terrified. I was terrified, but knew I had to keep it together. I stayed awake the rest of the night. The following day we moved into my parents' guest room under the guise of bug-bombing our place. After a couple of days I confided to my mom what we had experienced, and she, my aunt, and a friend of theirs who was a reputed curandera, or witch doctor, went to our little nest and cleansed it. Thereafter, 
We never experienced frightening things, but we did continue to experience other things, like glowing orbs, floating jellyfish-type specters, an older woman who walked in from outside into the kitchen and disappeared. None of it was frightening, not like the experiences of before, and the baby grew into a toddler who didn't cry in terror, but instead clapped his hands and gurgled amicably with something that wasn't there, but at least didn't scare the bejesus out of him. We moved shortly after he turned one, into a two-bedroom, one-bath home. It was a trim, neat little house, with a large yard and lovely, mature trees. Here, whatever had been kept at bay before, found its way back to us again. I don't know why I think it's the same thing, but it seemed to have started the same way. Tapping and knocking on the walls and ceiling. Our son developed night terrors. Pictures would fall off walls and shatter. We would hear the sound of shattering glass, but couldn't find the source. We all three took to sleeping in the same room, on the same bed, hoping to allay the night terrors. We only lived there two years before moving again. Back in high school, around the end of my junior year, I believe, it became popular to go on these adventurous endeavors to haunted places. Literally, a group of about 30 of us would carpool to some abandoned house one weekend or to some secluded forest the next, spending the days at school in between searching for more places like this in the area. Anyhow, we had this cavalier nature about us when it came to potential hauntings. At some point, a friend of mine who was several years older than me told me about how he and his friends would do similar things when they were young. His childhood home backed up to a huge farm, and he and his friends would spend their days fishing or hanging out on this farm, so they were quite familiar with it. The owner, apparently a very religious man, a priest or pastor maybe, had owned the farm and a small house on the property. The story went that the owner had been locked up for murder and died in prison, leaving the farm to whomever, and it wasn't kept up. However, upon hearing the news of this man's demise, my friend told me that he and his friends had decided to go into this house. I guess the windows had been busted out and they opened a door and walked in. He described them fooling around and trying to scare one another. But he had decided to walk up the stairs, and upon his reaching the second floor he saw a coffin in the main, open room, the way he had explained it to me was that he didn't know what it was immediately, and sort of sauntered over to check it out, only to have the sudden flash of realization that this was a coffin in an abandoned house. I suppose he and his friends made a quick retreat from the house. Of course, he told this part of the story much better, peppering in more details about the man who owned the property that gave the story that mythical, supernatural sort of feel. I remember being frightened by his delivery and sincerity, though it is quite likely he had rehearsed it before for occasions like that. This story had taken place fifteen years or so previous to him telling me. I told one of my adventurous cohorts the story, and we thought it would be a good idea to investigate it. I knew where this person had lived, so we assumed we could simply walk behind his house, find the farm, then find the house. We had a grand plan to bring the whole group out on the weekend, but we weren't sure if we were being strung on a lie, or if this place was still there if it were true. Anyhow, after football practice one weekday, he and I drove out to the street my friend lived on. There was definitely a farm behind his and his entire street's homes. We decided to go ahead and sneak through someone's yard and onto the farm to see if the house was there. Once we made it through the manicured suburban yard and through the brush separating the farm, we were knee-deep in an overgrown field. We sort of hacked our way through a bit, and sure enough, as we made it to the edge of a hill, the house was only a hundred or so yards away. We had made it that far, so we decided to go in and investigate. As we approached this house, there was a huge black bird perched on its roof. Once we were within twenty feet of the house, the bird flew away from the house and perched upon a tree adjacent to the house. Being a bit nervous, we began questioning why the bird had made such an odd move, 
but thought better of making a big deal about it. Now, this house is the prototypical haunted house. It had that quant, historic look to it, with the broken windows, eerie shadows, and sort of ominous stature one associates with a haunted house. There was even a grave marker in the front yard. So, again, we were increasingly nervous as we approached this house. The door was jammed shut, but the window had been completely removed, so we played rock-paper-scissor for who would climb through first. I had the luxury of going in second, but did so quickly as being on the porch by myself was just as unsettling. The inside of the house had literally not been touched. Besides weather damage, most everything was intact. There were pictures and decorations still up, with a bit of furniture remaining. We eventually became comfortable with being inside and began to snoop around. Of course, we were fearful of trekking upstairs, afraid to find something we didn't want to find. Alas, we squeamishly crept up the stairs only to find an empty space. At this point, we became at ease with walking around the house, laughing off the ghost story mystique. As we looked through the main floor again, I noticed that there was a tiny door in the kitchen. It was about knee-high. Undauntedly, we flung it open only to reveal a dark stone stairwell that a person would literally have to crawl down. Its presence alone was terrifying for some reason, but it had a landing about halfway down, with the stairs turning a different direction and out of our sight. However, Perched on the landing and partly concealed by the walls to the other part of the stairwell was a large rectangular wooden box, a coffin. Now my friend and I weren't exactly small people, so I would imagine the sight of us pale-faced, with a cartoonish hair-on-neck shocked expression, trying to both squeeze out of a window at the same time would have been quite comical, not to mention the both of us in a dead sprint heading away from this house through waist-high weeds, I still laugh thinking about both of us running like that. Anyhow, we turned to look back about halfway to the end of the farm, just in time to see that massive black bird fly back from the tree and onto the house. We probably made double time from that point on. Not nearly as cool as the other stories, but it's as close as I've been to it. In hindsight, the whole thing was a bit odd, most especially the behavior of the bird. My friend and I attributed it to some sort of supernatural power, so at the very least we had a better reason to run like children. I tapped my fingers on the fraying leather of the steering wheel, trying to soothe my frayed nerves. Driving always made my anxiety worse, but lately it felt like a welcome distraction. I tried to remind myself that it wasn't as bad as I used to think. This was better than sitting at home spiraling in my thoughts. The sun hadn't quite risen yet as I maneuvered my old truck along the desolate back roads to work. I always avoided the main roads. Too many cars, too many eyes. It was easier out here where no one bothered you. The pavement was a mess the edges crumbling into deep ditches lined with tangled roots and dry grass. Only someone used to these roads would know how to dodge the potholes hidden under the canopy of withering oaks that loomed overhead. Despite the poor conditions, my Yoda barely struggled. It had been my first truck, and for all its creaks and groans, it was reliable. The morning light began to break through the trees, illuminating the cracked asphalt and the forest beyond. Squirrels played their suicidal games of chicken, darting in front of me. I didn't mind breaking. It kept my mind focused, keeping me from getting too lost in my usual anxious haze. Then, out of nowhere, headlights appeared up ahead, rounding the next bend. My grip on the steering wheel tightened. Cars were rare this early on these back roads, and every time I saw one, my stomach twisted. I hadn't renewed my tags in months or bothered with insurance. If it was a cop, I'd be in a world of trouble. Funny, someone with as much anxiety as me, ignoring something so basic. But as the car rounded the bend, something else caught my eye. It wasn't just any car. It was a silver Jeep, 
my wife's Jeep. My heart dropped, the familiar license plate coming into view. What the hell? Why was she on this road so early in the morning? She never took this route. I lifted my hand to wave, but as the car passed, I saw something that made my blood run cold. Through the tinted windows, I swore I saw a man driving. His face turned toward me for a second, just long enough for me to catch the reflection of a mask staring back at me. The truck jolted to a stop as I slammed the brakes. My mind raced. Where was Sarah? Why the hell would someone else be driving her car? I hadn't seen her in the passenger seat. Was this some family member borrowing her Jeep? But why wouldn't she tell me? And why the hell was the driver wearing a mask? My gut twisted in ways I hadn't felt before. Something wasn't right. No, something was terribly wrong. Without thinking, I threw the truck into reverse, tires screeching as I spun around. I killed the lights and floored it, following at a distance. The once peaceful woods were now suffocating as I tailed the jeep through the narrow, winding road. The trees, once full of life, felt oppressive, and the playful squirrels were long gone. As I got closer, I could see the jeep start to pick up speed. The driver knew. He knew I was following him. He began swerving, almost losing control as he bounced over the rough road. My old truck groaned in protest as I pushed it to keep pace, but I wasn't going to lose him. Not now. Whoever the hell this was, I needed answers. The jeep sped past my house, but not before I caught a glimpse of something that made my stomach lurch. A moving truck parked in the driveway. My hands clenched the wheel tighter. The chase became erratic. The masked driver began brake checking me, swerving violently. He was doing everything he could to keep me off him, but I wasn't backing down. We were nearing the highway now, and if he reached it, there'd be no way my beat-up truck could keep up. He'd be gone. No, I had to stop him now. When he slammed on the brakes again, I saw my chance. Instead of slowing down, I sped up. I pulled alongside him, praying my old truck wouldn't tip into the ditch beside me. The trees blurred as adrenaline pounded in my ears. Then I jerked the wheel, slamming the front corner of my truck into the rear of the Jeep. The world spun. My truck screeched as I lost control, the tires squealing as I fishtailed, eventually coming to a grinding halt. Smoke billowed from the hood, filling the morning air. I struggled to catch my breath, the adrenaline coursing through my veins making my vision blur. Then I heard the boom. I stumbled out of the cab my ankle twisting painfully in a pothole as I hit the ground. I barely registered the pain as I hobbled toward the overturned jeep, which was now lying in the ditch, smoke pouring from the wreckage. The woods had gone deathly silent. The door to the jeep squealed open. A man crawled out, his once white shirt now soaked in blood, holes torn through his mask. Blonde hair stuck out in tufts from the holes in his mask. His eyes, bloodshot and wild, fixed on me with a crazed intensity. Look what you fucking did, he screamed, his voice high-pitched and broken as he swung a shotgun in my direction. The blast shattered the windshield of my truck behind me, the second shot flying off into the trees. My mind screamed at me to run. I staggered back to my truck, yanking the door open just as another shot rang out this one taking the side mirror clean off. And then, over the chaos, I heard it. A faint scream. Sarah's scream. She was still in the jeep. I clambered into the truck, my fingers fumbling for the keys. Another shot punched a hole through the windshield, stuffing yellow foam from the passenger seat into the air. The man was reloading. I could hear him cursing under his breath. You're dead, you're dead. He growled a guttural sound like some wild animal. I jammed the key into the ignition, my heart pounding in my ears. The old Yoda roared to life just as the man finished loading the shotgun. I floored it, sending the truck lurching forward. His last shot went wide as my truck slammed into him. His body hurtled backward into a tree with a sickening crunch, my truck coming to a stop pinning him between steel and bark. For a moment, the world went silent again, 
save for the hissing engine of my wrecked truck. I climbed out, everything aching, my vision swimming. The man's body was crumpled, twisted at an unnatural angle. Blood smeared the tree, his blonde hair sticky with red. I staggered toward the jeep, fighting the pain shooting through my leg. Then, without warning, pain exploded through my back. I fell to the ground, gasping. You son of a bitch! I heard Sarah scream, her voice shaky, unhinged. I looked up just in time to see her standing over me, a knife in her hand, blood dripping from the blade. My blood. You killed him? She wailed, her face contorted with rage and grief. The man I had just pinned to the tree, her lover. She raised the knife again, ready to plunge it into my chest. But something in my gaze stopped her. Tears filled her eyes as she dropped the knife, collapsing to the ground in a heap. I loved him, she repeated over and over, her voice a broken whisper. I should have felt something, anger, sadness, betrayal. But instead I felt nothing. I stared at her as she sobbed, the shattered glass reflecting the woman I thought I knew. Sirens wailed in the distance, drawing closer. The man, Scott, I later learned, had been one of her colleagues. They'd been seeing each other behind my back and the drugs. God, the drugs. He'd hooked her on them, dragged her down into his mess, and somehow convinced her to kill me. They planned to ambush me at the house, but I'd left earlier than usual. Maybe that had saved my life. Sarah's in prison now. I visit her sometimes. I'm not really sure why. Funny thing is, my driving anxiety's been a lot better since that morning. Then again, everything feels kind of numb these days.